we had our society and they had theirs and it was sort of understood that, uh, that separation, illegal separation was the law of the land. It's just Southern, Southern, Southern. And the rules applied almost anywhere you went in the South. You know, for a black person, you were just black. It was a way of life. It's just the way it was. Um, unkindness and meanness and those kinds of things, um, I never witnessed any of that. There was very much a separate black community and white community. It just was. It was two different worlds. It was the South. It was Alabama. And it was in the late 50s. But as the 1960s began, things were going to change. This is the story of Huntsville, Alabama's civil rights struggle as seen through the camera lens of Dr. Sonny Herford, just one of the many men and women who fought for change. But his pictures recorded history as it happened. Actually, I bought that camera because I was going to do some uh, postgraduate seminars in Hawaii because I was not allowed to go to the seminars in Alabama. Because, see, they were all given in the, in the hotels. Back in those days, black people could not go through the front door of the hotel, not attend any meetings, or any seminars in the hotel. From his original documentary on the Huntsville Civil Rights Movement, this is how Dr. Herford saw Huntsville. This is Huntsville, Alabama, 1956. Even in those days, I was optimistic about Huntsville. When the local newspaper refused to put my bride's picture in it, I was optimistic about Huntsville. When two landlords refused to rent me office space to open my medical practice, I was optimistic about Huntsville. When I found I had to practice in a segregated hospital, I was optimistic about Huntsville. When I came down into the city and saw the disparity of the white and the black homes, I was optimistic about Huntsville. Yes, even then, I was still optimistic about Huntsville. In the 1950s, life in the South had not substantially changed since Reconstruction. Segregation affected most areas of life, politics, employment, education, even social activities couldn't go to a restaurant if we wanted to celebrate a birthday party, an anniversary. We just had to have it at home and we'd have parties at home and celebrate. And we had fun now, you know, at home. But we felt that as taxpayers and we were honest people, we were clean people, and we felt that we should have a right, you know, to go to these places. It sort of dehumanizes a person. There was absolutely no place in the state of Alabama that you could go to get a medical degree or a law degree, a dental degree, if you were black. Born in Huntsville, Sonny Herford had to go to Tennessee to get his medical degree and return to Huntsville as one of the few black doctors in Alabama. Starting a new practice and getting married, he wanted his bride's picture in the Huntsville Times, but the editor like editors in many northern and southern cities, said no. He told me uh, when I walked in there, he said, Dr. Herford, do you know what you're asking me to do? I said, what? He said, you're asking me to destroy the society page of the Huntsville Times. He says, if I put your wife's picture in the Huntsville Times or any other Negro woman, he said, no white bride would ever come to us with a picture in the future. He said, Dr. Herford, if you bring me one paper from Atlanta, from Birmingham, from Memphis, 
even from New York, you bring me one, and I'll put hers in there. I could not find one to save my life. I could not find a picture. It's no telling how much money I spent buying newspapers. I could not find one. As the 1960s approached, black leaders across the country were demanding change, and Huntsville was uniquely placed to make integration possible. Huntsville was sort of uh, different. You know, we, we used to say that it was an oasis in the state of Alabama. It was, it was just so different. You had so many people of intellect, so many intelligent people that understood. We knew the potential that Huntsville, Alabama had for becoming you know, NASA headquarters and everything like that. Federal town, big money, and we knew that they didn't want to mess that up. We were not like the rest of Alabama at the time. There was no Bull Connor in Huntsville. There was a man named uh, Grover Pilot who was chief of police, and I never heard him speak above a whisper. I mean, he was one of the softest men I've ever run across. Uh, we had a chief named Massey Tolan who was a, a gentleman, and if you'd told him to turn fire hoses on somebody, I suspect he would have quit his job and gone home. There just weren't thoughts like that in Huntsville. We were already turning into the rocket city. The German scientists were already here. The civil rights movement in Huntsville began when representatives from two high-profile national civil rights organizations, SNCC and CORE, arranged a few sit-ins at local lunch counters. There was an old law on the Huntsville books that said that any merchant or any landowner within the confines of this city could order any person off his property if he didn't want them on there. And if they did not leave after a reasonable length of time, he could call the authorities and they would arrest them. The demonstrators were arrested. The penalty was severe, a $100 fine plus 180 days hard labor. A local group called the Community Service Committee was formed. The lunch counter sit-ins would continue at Shoney's Big Boy, Liggett Rexall Drug Store, Woolworth Variety Store, Sears Department Store, G.C. Murphy Variety Store, Walgreens Drug Store, and W.T. Grant Company. Joining the Community Service Committee was a political science professor at Alabama A&M, Randolph Blackwell, who helped organize the nation's first lunch counter protest in North Carolina. He was also a lawyer, and he shared some ideas. There's no law that says any merchant in this city has to serve you ever. No law in the United States. He said, but you do have other recourses. You can pick it. There's not a labor union in this country is going to let you be convicted for picketing. And picketing, referred to as a poster walk, began. It was a way for average black citizens to demand change without the fear of being arrested. Though peaceful, the fear of violence affected both sides. We would not permit people to join our ranks unless they were committed to nonviolence. They could not carry guns or knives or anything, not even a fingernail file. Bibles, flags, and that sort of thing was all we ever carried. Our motivation came from the fact that we knew that violence breeds violence. You don't solve problems by fighting. That's what dogs do. Human beings negotiate. Whenever we got out on the streets with our post walking, or picketing, or whatever, if we were going to have a prayer march or whatever, it would always be a great number of police cars cruising up and down the street. It seemed as though that they were trying to uh, prevent any type of violence. I've heard the mayor say on many occasions, give the direct order to police officers, make sure nobody gets hurt. Meanwhile, sales in downtown stores were being affected. Cars of potential shoppers were seen just turning around and people going home. 
Local civil rights leaders monitored the merchant's reaction and planned the next push. We had another educator who could impersonate people and change her voice. And if we wanted to know how a certain merchant downtown felt about the movement and about hiring black people and what have you, we'd put her on the phone and she'd call him and pretend to be Mrs. Van Valkenburg, <laughs> Mrs. So-and-so down in South uh, East Huntsville. And uh, she would find out just exactly how he felt about the situation. And she'd come back and tell us about that. And this was then invaluable for us. Community Service Committee representatives met with Huntsville Mayor Speck Searcy. They asked for a desegregation of the drinking fountains, restrooms, and lunch counters. He refused. He said, I can't do that. They're not going to do it. If, if they let you come in, they're going to lose their other customers. And nobody's going to, to lose the customers he's had for the last 15, 20 years just to accommodate you people. It was not politically correct to do that kind of thing. And I don't think that's a criticism of anybody. That was a part of the times. I never heard him say an unkind word about anybody. I had no hard feelings against blacks or whites, as far as I ever witnessed, and I went, witnessed it all. There would be no help from city leaders. More needed to be done. A psychological warfare committee was established. They traveled to other cities to see what worked and organized friends from out of state to write the mayor in Huntsville demanding change. It was just a letter writing campaign to bombard the mayor with letters and it's no telling how many letters he may have gotten. We said we think we can outsmart these people, we think that we've got uh, enough pieces on the chessboard we might be able to, uh, to win the game. While the committee looked for other tactics, they kept up the lunch counter sit-ins and the poster walks. We protested and we did it in a peaceful way. We just wanted to do it the right way and wanted the other side to see how we felt. But we always made sure that we stayed together because we knew that they were fearful of us in numbers. And if they were going to do something to you, they would catch one or two alone. Because of the potential for violence and the possibility of six months of hard labor, it was mostly students who continued the lunch counter sit-ins. It was really scary at times. I mean, it was really scary. 17, 18 year old kid, back then we were very f fearful of law officers and, and white people in general. And not really knowing whether you're going to be hurt and knowing that even if someone did strike you that you couldn't do anything about it. Our mission was to accomplish what we were trying to do by nonviolent means, and we were committed to that. We would go in, and uh, most of the time we might have a, a friend, a white friend, that would go in first and uh, let us know that everything was operating. And then we would all just slip in there all at once and sit down, and they would turn the lights off when we got there and close the launch counter. But uh, the people who were, were there eating would be angry, and they would curse you and get at you. And some of the students were actually attacked, physically attacked. In fact, one girl was knocked off a lunch counter in Woolworths. They wouldn't put anybody in jail about striking a black girl not in the 1960s. That wasn't going to happen. Any violence and verbal abuse took place before the police arrived. The arrests were always peaceful. I was at Walgreens several times when arrests were made. There was no one handcuffed, voluntarily went after we served a warrant. Time in jail was limited. The city didn't want to fill the jail, and the movement needed workers out protesting, not serving time. But if we bail you out, you can go back tomorrow and get arrested again. And some people did get arrested four, five, six, seven times. Students didn't have much money. Their release was arranged through the signing of bail and appeal bonds. 
Some black residents literally pledged their homes against the promise that protesters would return to court. But there were a few Caucasian people who signed some of the appeal bonds and uh, there was retaliation against them. Just to point out one instance, there was a, a white pediatrician who signed some appeal bonds and they told him they were, they were going to boycott him. Some of the obstetricians said, we're, we're not going to send a single baby to you. But he didn't stop signing the bonds. After weeks and weeks of protest, the poster walkers got bored just walking up and down the street. A new technique was discovered, almost by accident. We found that we could take three or four people and tie up one theater for a whole afternoon. And what we would do is let them go in groups of threes or fours and let number one walk up and ask for a ticket. And she says, no, I can't serve you a ticket. And he'd just go back to the end of the line. And then number two would go up and say, I'd like a ticket. And she said, I can't serve you a ticket. And he'd go back to the end of the line. They'd just keep going around and around. It may seem like it was boring, but it wasn't because it was a diversion from the poster walking. Though the protests continued, there was no help from the city. Huntsville was changing from a cotton mill town to a high-tech center. The opinion of the nation was important for that transformation, and an obscure protest in New York was just the right action at the right time to create change. The one that really got their attention, my mother-in-law. I have this picture of her and her friends in New York picketing the New York Stock Exchange carrying the sign, don't buy in Huntsville. Fear of outside pressure, possibly affecting the space program money, did get the mayor's attention. He set up a biracial committee to look into desegregating the city. But the Community Service Committee saw it as a sham. The two blacks he appointed were not active in the civil rights movement. The sit-ins and marches continued. Pressure on civil rights leaders to back off was intense. And those people who had jobs and were making a living would always tell us, well, just cool it, because I'm sure they were afraid of their job. And it stopped a lot of the college students. We start out with hundreds of college students. We might end up with 10. Just remember who the black middle class are. They were scared to death, good Lord. I mean, if you, got a, you finally got a split level on a Lincoln, sure, they're beholden to the white. Remember who signs their checks? We started out, we must have had four, five, six hundred people that were marching, singing and praying and meeting and a lot of people helping us with negotiations with the mayor and city council. After eight, ten, twelve weeks, participation begins to drop off, as you would imagine. People think, gee, I'm beating my head against a brick wall, and what do I have to show for it? So, in one of our strategy sessions, the psychological warfare, one of our members said, why don't we get a dynamic speaker to come here and speak to our community and try to solidify the community? They said, we need to bring back some people we've lost, we need to bring in new people, we need to see if we can even get some people from the other race to join us. We just had two, three, or four at that time, uh, Caucasian people. Somewhere somebody mentioned Dr. King's name. But he was not nearly so famous, you know, at that time as he came to be. Oh, there was a lot of buzzing about him being there and what was he there for and was he going to stir up people and cause trouble and all that kind of stuff. It was fairly early in the movement and there was no violence over there at all. The police were there, lots of police cars, again for protection to make sure that nothing happened. He spoke in the church. He came as a preacher and he spoke over on Church Street at the church and there, there was just a huge crowd of people there. Later that night, he spoke at Oakwood College Gymnasium. We know that the struggle in the town, in the final analysis, is not between black men and 
white men, but it is a tension between justice and injustice. It is a struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And let us read our white brothers who are so worried about our advantage. That if that is a victory, it will not be a victory merely for 20 million Negroes. But if there is a victory, it will be a victory for justice, a victory for freedom, a victory for democracy. And it will make a better nation for everybody because the festering soil segregation debilitates the white man as well as the Negro. And we are struggling to see him. He came and he made a very dynamic speech. And so uh, a lot of people got to hear him, both white and black. And after that, the community did come together. And the mayor named two black civil rights leaders to the biracial committee. And then he said, well, he couldn't get anybody to white to serve on the committee. Nobody at all. In the whole community, nobody. It would have had to have been a white knight to step out there and serve on that. While it was, everybody knew it was coming, it was, it was not a popular thing to be on. So the sit-ins and poster walks continued. We had been for weeks and weeks uh, marching around the city and sitting in and all of that. And uh, whenever we would do that, if you needed to relieve yourself, if we were downtown, we'd go over to the courthouse and go to the black restroom. So this particular day, Mrs. Cashin, my daughter told her she wanted to use the restroom. Mrs. Cashin just decided, I'm going to go to the white restroom. <laughs> she said, I'm going to go over there. She said, one thing, I want to see if it's cleaner than ours. And, and sure enough, when she came back, she said it was cleaner, cleaner than ours. Nothing at all happened. And then after that, uh, black people started going to the other one and, and nobody ever did anything. It was the first of the quiet desegregations to happen in Huntsville, but it wasn't enough. The Psychological Warfare Committee came up with an idea. Instead of arresting students, what if a dentist's wife and three-month-old baby plus a very pregnant doctor's wife got thrown in jail? The nation would be disgusted by this treatment of a pregnant woman and an infant. Somebody said, well, how do you know they're going to get arrested? So all you got to do is go to a merchant's place, and I guarantee you, you're going to get arrested. In case there was trouble, a student, Francis Sims, who had already been arrested several times and knew the routine, was invited to join the two doctor's wives. On April 11th, the three ladies, Joan Cashin, Martha Herford, and Francis Sims, plus the Cashin's baby girl, Cheryl, sat down at the lunch counter at Walgreens to get hamburgers and something to drink. After a short while, they didn't leave. Then they called the policemen. They came and arrested the three ladies, promptly carried them to jail. So then the word got out. And then it was in the hospital times. And then the AP and the UPI <laughs> carried the story, so it went all over the United States. The arrest was peaceful, the baby given to relatives. When they got down to the county jail, the, uh, the sheriff was about to come up for re-election. And he pleaded with them to leave. <laughs> he said, why don't you leave? We don't want you here. And uh, they wouldn't leave. And we were locked up. I didn't know what jail looked like. We were in the same cell, the three ladies. It was dirty, and they had that open light commode or toilet facility and that was nasty and the beds were uncovered just dirty mattresses and I remember I had clothing and a coat I used that to cover it when I slept that night there was a lot of buzzing around how we gonna get these women home where they belong the city let them out on their own recognizance and so then guess what the mayor found two white people to serve on the committee. Then the biracial committee starts meeting and then they decide that they are going to contact the merchants. So they started talking to some of them and the, the merchants uh, would not cooperate with them. So then we said, well, we need another big push. 
When I went to Nashville, I found out that they had had what they call Blue Jean Sunday. Instead of buying suits and uh, $100 dresses, they had decided that they'd buy 250 blue jeans for Easter and knock the merchants out of uh, three or four million dollars. And so in Huntsville, we decided we would do that too. It wasn't fashionable in those days to wear blue jeans. Very few people wore blue jeans in those days, and especially to go to church. And it was taboo on Easter. And there was another problem. Back in those days, you could be arrested if you asked somebody to boycott. So the Community Service Committee printed cards saying, are you shopping for segregation or are you buying for freedom? And passed them out on the public street. No mention of a boycott, but the message was clear even from the pulpit. Now they say in Alabama you can't use the word boycott. But let me tell you this. And if you can hold out in an economic withdrawal for 13 weeks, businessmen will go to their knees. And if you can hold out for 26 weeks, you will bankrupt this city and put it in such a condition that they will beg you to come down and work at any counter you choose. Organizers didn't even want the blue jeans bought in Huntsville but rather encourage shopping trips to Scottsboro, Decatur, Athens, or Fayetteville. Thousands of hours went into organizing the protest, even up to Good Friday. Boycott leaders were unsure of the community's commitment. Instead of us asking the people to boycott, on Good Friday, we passed out self-denial folders asking the people to deny themselves of having these fineries and fast and pray. Easter Sunday came. Some observers said they had never seen so many blue jeans. We estimate that the city merchants lost at least a million dollars for that Easter. Some of the ladies who didn't want to wear blue jeans bought uh, denim material and made themselves denim skirts. And the preachers preached from their pulpits in blue jeans. That's unheard of. The push worked. After Blue Jeans Sunday, the biracial committee actively contacted businesses, setting the stage for desegregation, even if at least one white member was unwilling to publicly show his involvement. So he tells his mother he's going bowling, and he puts on his bowling pants and gets his bowling shoes and his bowling ball, and he comes to the meeting. But still, no date had been set to integrate the lunch counters. They decided that uh, they'd just stop arresting people and just start ignoring, ignoring them. What they would do, uh, they'd just let you sit there. And, but what we would try to do was to have enough people so that we could fill up all the seats. And then, remarkably, another quiet desegregation. On Mother's Day, after church, Reverend Bell called me and he said, uh, Dr. Hereford, you want to go to the park? I said, what park? We had no park in Huntsville, our Madison County, that black people could go to. Absolutely none. He said, Big Spring Park. I said, yeah, <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> he said, you're going to bring your camera? I said, yeah. He said, well, let's go over there have some fun at the park. There were some stairs, but nobody said anything. Nobody did anything, and nobody said anything. And ever since that day, the blacks have been using that park. On Armed Forces Day, the Community Service Committee saw an opportunity and seized it. Ironically, it would put the Huntsville civil rights leaders face to face with a relatively unknown politician who would affect their lives and the state of Alabama for decades to come. There was a gubernatorial race going on. George C. Wallace was on the south side of the courthouse and we were on the north side of the courthouse. And then we had a truck with those same types of placards that we had walked with downtown. 
had the placards uh, stapled to the truck and rode around the truck around and around the courthouse. We had a tape recorder playing patriotic music. We had Bibles, we had balloons, and we had American flags. By now, the Community Service Committee thought reaching people outside of Huntsville might be the key to forcing desegregation. We filled those balloons with helium, and then we made out cards describing what was going on in Huntsville. And then we accidentally dropped some of the cards on the steps so that the mayor and the city council would see the messages that were being sent out. From Dr. Herford's original documentary. These were dedicated people. They have been in this movement now almost six months, and they have very little to show for their efforts. Tomorrow morning, some of these same people will be picketing in Chicago before the Midwest Stock Exchange. They sincerely believe that with the help of God, they can overcome. The New York Stock Exchange protest had created concessions. Maybe a Midwest Stock Exchange demonstration would too. A small group of Huntsville civil rights leaders went off to Chicago to picket and pass out leaflets. One gentleman got a leaflet before he went in and he came out and he shook my wife's hand. He said, you sure did help me today. I was going in there to buy some stock. And he said, uh, I decided not to buy stock in that company. Civil rights leaders knew a single protest in Chicago wasn't going to kill the Huntsville economy. But as a symbol, it was powerful. They knew that if we raised enough dust that these federal contracts were going to go somewhere else. And I mean, these good old boys liked that money. So then after they got word that we had been to the Midwest Stock Exchange, then they went again to talk to those merchants. And five or six merchants decided to go ahead and desegregate their lunch counters. And so it was decided that uh, they're going to all do it on the same day and they're going to all do it the same hour. But the hour has to be kept a secret. They will have a trial period, but if there's any problem, then they're going to discontinue the trial period. So we didn't want the KKK to know where to go and when to go to cause the problem. Those persons whom you see coming out of this door now will be the first black people to eat in an integrated restaurant in the state of Alabama. The Community Service Committee fought for and won other concessions besides desegregating the lunch counters, hotels, motels, bowling alleys, skating rinks, and other public facilities. Remarkably, over the months, 600 charges were filed against sit-in protesters. All were dropped. Plus, the city promised to hire policemen and firemen from the black community. The next morning, somebody went downtown and made an addition to the mayor's historical marker. I know who did it, but to reveal his name would not serve any useful purpose. This was July 10th, 1962. Keep in mind, this was two years before President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill. But there was still unfinished business. Dr. Herford had gone to public schools in Huntsville. He was determined no other black student would suffer as he had. I used to walk six miles every day to school. There were no buses for black children. Only white children got to ride to school buses. I especially wanted to be able to use the library, you know since I wanted to, uh, to become a doctor. No library in the school, and I could not use the, the public library. We had no lunchroom. We had um, no playground. 
since we didn't have a chemistry lab at the school, I built me a chemistry lab at my house. Getting an education was so difficult for a black child. Of the 100 students that started with Dr. Herford in the first grade, only 17 graduated. The black school was bordered on three sides by the city dump. I call it the horseshoe phenomenon. It surrounded my school just like a horseshoe. And you can imagine how it was. We didn't have air conditioning. So you can imagine in the early fall and the late spring how it must have been trying to sit in the classroom. In late 1962, 35 black families petitioned the school board to desegregate the public schools. Nothing happened. At times, the school board would put desegregation last on the agenda, adjourn, and leave black citizens sitting in the audience. It was decided that some black students must attempt to register for school and be turned down. Then the issue would go to court, and a judge would decide. You may not win in, in the first trial, but when you get to appellate court, you may win, and if not, when you get to Supreme Court, you know you're going to win because Brown versus Board of Education was nine years old. Pressure on the black families was intense. By the time of the court trial, only four children remained from the original 35 families. One of those children was Dr. Herford's son. Why should I ask somebody else to send their son when I have a son? Our committee felt that these children should attend a play school that summer. The black children who were going to enter the school situation, along with some white students. Uh, heretofore, black students have not attended any white schools, and white students have not attended any black schools. We wanted them to get used to each other. In August of 1963, the lawsuit was heard in Birmingham's federal court. After the judge heard both sides, he ruled from the bench. He never even <laughs> deliberated one minute. He said, now admit these four petitioning students immediately, immediately to start the uh, first week in September. And then by January 2nd, submit to me a plan which outlines the integration of all the schools in the city of Huntsville and all the schools in the county of Madison. Traditionally, the schools have opened the day after Labor Day, but uh, this year the governor sent troops and uh, the schools were closed and we were turned away. The next two days, we were also turned away. Friday, we went back to federal court in Birmingham, and Monday, we were permitted to register. On this day, Dr. Herford received more than a half dozen death threats. One of our workers tells me that uh, when Sonny and I walked to school that morning, that uh, the KKK was following us in a car. But I didn't know about it, you know. And I, I would still have gone, <laughs> even if I'd known they were there. I didn't think that there was anyone in Huntsville cruel enough to do something to a child, an innocent child. And maybe my thinking was off, but that's how I believed. And so, I trusted God that he would take care of my son and see him through that. And so he did. When my son crossed over that threshold at Fifth Avenue School, 100 years of segregation in public schools in the state of Alabama ended. Thanks be to God. Huntsville became the first integrated public school system in Alabama. It happened peacefully. In fact, the young Sonny Herford IV had very little trouble. 
I remember when I was in first grade being in the cafeteria lunch line. This was a little white girl who was not big enough to get her tray down off the top of the stack. And so I got her tray down for her and I went to hand it to her and she looked me right in the eye and she said, oh no, my mother told me never to take anything from a nigger. As youngsters, we don't have those prejudices. It was very clear to me that that was her mother speaking through her. I really believe that it's just because we were all so young and most of us had not been taught about prejudice at that age. And I think that uh, to most of those kids, I was just another kid in that school. And I certainly just thought of myself as another kid in that school. Before the Birmingham riots, before the Civil Rights Act, Huntsville had desegregated and done it without violence. Never in my life have I seen such enthusiasm, such vim, such vitality, such courage, such endurance, such perseverance, such dedication, and such cohesion as the people of Huntsville showed in this movement. And after 35 years, Dr. Sonny Herford continues to live in the city he grew up in, practice medicine in, raise his family in. Huntsville, the city he changed forever. I am still optimistic about Huntsville. I can only say to you that I bid you Godspeed as you continue in this magnificent work. And I know that as a result of your labors and as a result of your struggles, you will be able to make Huntsville a better community and a better city in which to live. I certainly want to express my personal appreciation to the officers and members of the Community Service Committee. To end the reign of segregation, God needs you. I am not able and I will never be able to convince everybody here tonight. Most of you will go back home not convinced that you must struggle for freedom. But if I can just convince a few people here tonight that God needs you. God needs you to work for him, to help him make the kingdom a reality. God needs you now. He needs you at this minute. He needs you at this hour. Who this evening will be a co-worker of the almighty God and set out to get your freedom, realizing that freedom is the greatest thing in all the world. It's worth losing a job for. Freedom is worth getting killed for. Maybe before this struggle is over, some will have to get killed. But if physical death is the price that some must pay to free their children from a permanent life of psychological death, then nothing can be more redemptive. Yes, we must come to see once more and sing with our forefathers of old, oh freedom, oh freedom. Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my father and be saved. This is what we need at this hour. It will not be easy. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. And with this faith, we will be able to go out and bring this new age into being. And this will be the day when we will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee, Sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And this must become literally true all over America. Freedom must ring from every mountainside. And so I say this evening, let it ring from the mighty mountains of New Hampshire. Let it ring from the heightening hills of New York. Let it ring from the prodigious 
Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let it ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let it ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And so let it ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let it ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let it ring from every hill and mole hill of Alabama. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last.